watching the TV. Of course, the camera is off to my right here, and it's about the only one I've got going at the moment. And so I've, I normally have the camera face on to me, but I just still haven't quite got things configured here the way I want them to down here in the in the new studio environment. And of course, so you can see the wall to my uh, to my left in the pretty bad state. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's slowly being worked on. So uh, in the hopefully in the near future, it'll be painted and looking a little bit better than it is. So uh, otherwise, I would have had the camera in a, another position, so you didn't see that. Anyway, to kick off the uh, news inf information tonight, of course, it being the first of the month or well, the first begin a new month, uh, we have um, Sky Notes from Tanya Hill from the Planetarium. And uh, she writes Sky Notes for February 2024. She talks about the final Mars flight of Ingenuity helicopter. And, uh, and then she talks about Neptune and Uranus. Uh, something about the colour of those two planets. And then we go straight into what's happening up in the night sky for the month. So let's kick that off uh, with the what she reports about Ingenuity. There's uh, an image here that, that she's uh, given me of uh, the little uh, helicopter, which I'll bring up on screen now. So there it is. A little Ingenuity. It's 72 flights that... Uh, little helicopter managed to uh, to do so ingenuity that took the first powered flight on another planet on April 19 2021 and carried out 72 aerial journeys as a scout for NASA's Perseverance rover has made its final descent after damage to at least one blade uh, of its high-speed double rotators as in rotors its extended mission far exceeded expectations with Ingenuity flying much further than planned and totaling over two hours aloft in the thin Martian air. And how we know that the one of the rotors of the helicopter uh, is damaged, there is a picture of it. Um, there it is, a cast shadow, or a shadow cast, <laughs> uh, from the uh, the sun by the, the casting a shadow of the damaged blade uh, on the Martian surface. So uh, there's uh, there's enough damage there to aerodynamically cause the uh, aircraft to be uh, the helic little helicopter to be unstable. It seems. So uh, 72 flights later, it's uh, it's now. Um, grounded uh, more, more ways than one so um, yeah it's a bit uh, unfortunate anyway but like uh, like they're saying it, it managed to uh, to get quite a quite a, a few flights in so uh, it's uh, it's done a, a beaut job and it's proven the point uh, that uh, we can fly on the Martian surface with the right uh, aerodynamically uh, um, aircraft, it's uh, it's possible to fly within the uh, on the Martian um, atmosphere. Um, okay, so the next thing that uh, Tanya is uh, talking about is Neptune is not so blue, not Neptune not so blue, and Uranus shows its seasons. So, okay, what's this about? She's got an image here to bring up, so I'll bring that up. And uh, what Tanya is talking about is that um, in this shot we've got on screen at the moment, Uranus uh, is at the left and Neptune is at the right uh, and uh, are actually closer in colour at the bottom than the earlier images taken by Voyager at the top. So the two images at the top are taken by uh, earlier Voyager 2 images and the images at the bottom have been reprocessed at, in this particular for this particular study. So what she's uh, talking about here is that the ice giant colors updated the original 1989 Voyager views of Neptune were enhanced for, for detail to show clouds and other features that gave it that rich blue look. 
an artificial exaggeration which uh, has persisted. New reprocessing of the original Voyager data and studies using the Hubble Space Telescope and very large array in Chile confirms the planet is actually much closer in colour to Uranus. And uh, both are a pale greenish blue, uh, with Neptune only slightly more blue. So the two the two planets in the bottom of that image there uh, are a more accurate rendition of the colour of those two pla outer planets. Um, okay, and uh, I haven't uh, downloaded this, but they, they've got some animation here. Uh, which shows the sequence of seasons of Uranus uh, is derived from observations made by the Lowell Observatory and covers a period from 1900. Uh, and how do you work that year out? Anyway, it says here it covers a period from 1900 to 2068, two Uranian years. The left hand is a human eye view. Look, I won't worry about it, but because I, I haven't got the image up to show, um, but uh, suffice to say that they're they're showing in this image here on the the um, website, the Science Works uh, website for the uh, February Sky Notes, the seasonal color changes to both uh, both planets, um, or actually for Uranus mostly. Um, all right, so let's go down to another part here. Um, another part of this uh, article is uh, simulation, simulations of Uranus and Neptune. Uh, not only do these giant planets have interesting dynamic atmospheres, but uh, both also have complex rotation axes uh, and magnetic fields, uh, especially Uranus. Uh, in these two diagrams, now they've got two diagrams here, all right, so... Um, I'll bring up the first one, uh, this fella here, um, so, uh, yeah, in these two diagrams, this is the first diagram, the yellow arrow points to the sun, and the, the short blue arrow marks the rotational axis, and the cyan magnetic axis uh, and, the cyan, and the cyan is the magnetic axis, that's right. For both planets their rotation and magnetic axis do not align and their magnetic fields are offset internally. These images give only a rough idea about but the full animations which is provided in a link uh, reveal full impressions as the planets rotate. So uh, the one the image you're seeing right now is the, is Uranus and is highly inclined at rotation and offset magnetic field, and this next image is um, Neptune. So I can swap the, between the two quickly. You can see the differences here. So that one there, uh, hang on, that's Uranus. That's Neptune. Um, and Neptune's and its axis magnetic field is what you're seeing there. So these simultations from which these stills are taken uh, are by Tom Bridgman and NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio and can be viewed or downloaded um, by a couple of links that uh, Sky ScienceWorks has provided in this. It's always difficult uh, when they provide links. <laughs> it's part of the article there. So you just have to take my word for it. Anyway, um, the studies for Uranus and Neptune is uh, is rather amazing, uh, what we know about those two planets. So, uh, okay, next on the, the uh, Sky Notes, if I can find my camera, uh, we are going into Melbourne sometimes. So, on the 1st of February... The, uh, the sun rose at 6.32 and sat at 8.33. On Sunday the 11th of February, the sun will rise at 6.44, set at 8.23. Um, by Wednesday the 21st, uh, the sun will be rising at 6.55 and setting at 8.11. And by the end of the month, on Thursday the 29th of February, 
The sun will rise at 7.03 a.m., setting at 8.01 p.m. Um, moon phases. The third quarter. There is a third quarter on Saturday the 3rd, tomorrow. There will be a new moon on the 10th, Saturday the 10th. A first quarter phase on Saturday the 17th. And a full moon on Saturday the 24th. And lunar apogee, apogee, furthest from the Earth, is on Monday the 26th at 406,312 kilometres. And then on Sunday the 11th, the Moon will be at lunar perigee, closest to the Earth, at 358,088 kilometres. Uh, as far as the planets go... For the month, Mercury is soon to disappear behind the Sun and is not visible this month. Venus remains visible low in the east early in the morning, rising around 4.30am before being washed out by dawn light. Mars will be faint but visible mid-month in the early morning. It will rise in the east from 4.40am shortly after Venus before it, or two, it two fades in the morning light. Jupiter contains continues sorry, to, to be seen in the northwest from 8:30 p.m. in the evening twilight before setting by 11:30 p.m. And Saturn is too close to the sun, so is no longer visible at night, and is soon to move to conjunction behind the sun. Meteors. The Alpha Centaurids and Beta Centaurids are active from the 2nd to the 25th of the month, peaking on the 8th. Uh, they are different, but it is difficult to distinguish between them, occurring low in the south near the two pointers. They are not strong showers, but often have fireballs with persistent trails. 25 per hour can occur, but 6 per hour has been the usual that's the Alpha Centaurids and the Beta Centaurids between the 2nd and the 25th of the month with the peak on the 8th. Uh, okay, um, stars and constellations. Turning to the east, high in the sky is Ceres, the brightest star at night and the principal star in Kansas Major. This is one of Orion's two hunting dogs, which is why Ceres is also referred to as the dog star. Directly below Ceres is the star Procyon, which marks the location of Kansas Minor, uh, Orion's smaller dog. Many cultures have recognized the first evening appearance of Ceres as a marking a special time during the year for religious and architectural or other reasons. It sits 8.6 light years away, making it the fifth nearest system to us, and its energy output reflects a name appropriately derived from the Greek Ceros, meaning glowing or scorching. Ceres is, however, a binary system. Ceres A is twice the mass of our Sun, almost 17 times as large and 25 times as luminous. Small faint Ceres B, however, is a white dwarf about the size and mass as uh, the Earth and is the remnant core of a star that was once similar to our Sun. Ceres A and B orbit their mutual centre of mass every 50 years. Turning to the northwest, directly north lies Orion the Hunter, seen in the southern hemisphere upside down. The famous three stars of his belt are Mintaka and Al Lumen and Al Nittak. Al Nittak. From his belt and going upper right is a line of stars which forms his sword, in the centre of which is a beautiful Orion nebula. A vast stellar nursery, 1,500 light years from us. Upper left in Orion is the blue-white supergiant star Regal, which is, marks one of his feet. And the lower right is the red supergiant Betelgeuse, which is one of his shoulders. 
Orion's three belt stars also marks mark the base of the southern southern hemisphere's saucepan asterism. To the northwest is the open star cluster that hides or Hades, um, 153 light years away, and forms the inverted V of the head of Taurus the bull. The red giant star Aldebaran at its lower right corner is much closer to us at 65 light years. To the left is the Pallades, a close cluster of young blue stars 430 light years from us. These stars are formed together and are generally bound together under their mutual gravitational attraction, although over millions of years it is expected the cluster will disperse, also known as the Seven Sisters, and for many cultures across the world they represent a group of women. Turning to the southeast to the southwest, the Southern Cross and the two pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri are low in the southeast, uh, in the southwest are the two small nearby galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds, named in honour of 16th century explorer Ferdinand, Ferdinand Magellan, who embarked on the first circumnavigation of the globe. They looked like faint fuzzy patches, but are best seen away from city lights. The earliest known physical depictions of them are in the petroglyphs in South America. Petro, petroglyphs. Arcing across the night sky and slowly wheeling as the Earth rotates during the night, to the east is the majestic Milky Way, billions of distant stars of our galaxy. In visible light, our view of the galaxy is largely restricted to our local spiral arm, which is one of several that sit in the disk of the galaxy. We are looking edge on into that flat disk of billions of stars. By contrast, the two darker sides of the night sky are a view out to the galactic plane. These in, in those directions, we see um, in those directions we seen far fewer stars for a few thousand light years before intergalactic space begins. All right, so uh, the International Space Station, which orbits every ninety minutes at an average distance of four hundred kilometers, appearing like a bright star moving across the sky. Some bright passes are below for the Melbourne region. Uh, on Saturday the 12th, it will pass overhead in the early morning and again in the evening, giving two chances to spot it in one day. So on Thursday the 8th of February, there's a passing that begins at 5.30am to 5.37 a.m. coming in from the southwest to the east-northeast. And then again in the evening, uh, yeah, they didn't say the evening here. One, but okay, the evening, there's two passes in the evening. There's Sunday the 11th <clears throat> at 9.20 p.m. to 9.07 p.m. <clears throat> northwest to the southeast. <clears throat> and then Thursday the 29th, there's a passing on 29th, <clears throat> coming in, starting from 9, oh, excuse me, <coughs> testing, 1, 2, 3, testing, Harlow, that's it, we cleared it. Uh, on Thursday the 29th at 9.02 p.m. to 9.07 p.m., southwest to the northeast. But you can find, uh, for your location, you can find other passings <coughs> of the International Space Station from the Heavens Above website. Heavens Above gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and other major satellites, live, view, live views, uh, sky views, and 3D visualizations. So be sure to first enter your location under the configuration setting. Uh, all right. <clears throat> There's a few dates here. On this day, on the 1st of February, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia 
disintegrated on re-entry, killing all seven astronauts and halting the shuttle program for over two years. Also on the 1st of February 1970, US astronomer Vera Rubin finds evidence of dark matter by studying the motion of stars and galaxy rotation not consistent with Newton's laws. On the 3rd of February 1996, Luna 9 made the first soft landing on the moon and sent first panoramic images of the ocean of storms. On the 4th of February 1976, Lunar Orbiter 3 launches to the moon to select Apollo landing sites. On the 5th of February 1963, Dutch astronomer uh, Martin Schmidt discovers quasars, cosy quasar radio sources. And on the 7th of February 1979, Pluto moves inside Neptune's orbit for the first time since its 1930 discovery. On the 8th of February 1969, the Allende meteorite, the largest carbonaceous meteorite found, lands near the village of Allende, Mexico. On the 9th of February 1986, the first module of the Mir space station is launched into Earth orbit. 9th of February 1986, also, uh, last visit of Comet Halley, which is met by a flotilla of probes, notably ESA's uh, Giotto, uh, with Comet's next return due in mid-2061. On, also on the 9th of February, 1473, the birth of Nicholas Copernicus, famous for his sun-centred theory uh, on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, 1543, which triggered the Canopican Revolution. Uh, on the 9th, also on the 9th of February, 1975, Sawyer 17, uh, returns to Earth, setting Soviet record of 29 days in space. <clears throat> On the 11th of February, 2003, first measurements using the Wilkinson Microwave Androscopy Probe data to reveal the relic Big Bang temperature as a variation across the universe. And on the 12th of February, 1947, 100 ton iron meteorite falls in at Sikot Alin, southeast Russia, the largest in recorded history, brighter than the sun, with a deafening sound and smoke trail lasting for several hours. Ah, that was 12th of February 1947, 100 ton iron meteorite, southeast Russia. Also on the 12th of February 1961, the Verona 1 probe launched by the USSR to sent to, to Venus by the Soviet Union. Also on the 12th of February 2001, the Nia Shoemaker USA is first probe to land on an asteroid 433 Eros. One more date. On the 13th of February 2004, discovery of the largest diamond white star, BPM 37093, is announced. The discovery of the largest diamond white star. <laughs> Alright, there's a few more dates there, but we shall leave those to later. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narriwarren South. Um, okay, just a little bit of a news update. Japan's slim moon lander snaps final photos before going dormant during a lunar night published 14 hours ago and there's a picture here uh, of this last image taken from the lunar surface uh, the spacecraft will sleep through the deep cold of lunar night and may or may not wake up afterward 
The image here that you're seeing on screen is a mosaic, mosaic images of the lunar surface captured by the multiband spectroscopic camera, MBC, on board Japan's SLIM moon lander immediately after its Jan 19 touchdown. The left image after power was restored about 10 days after uh, later and the right image is as the as the direction of the sun changed from east to west so did the shadows cast on the lunar surface so it's it's more or less two identical images but uh, taken at different times where you can see that how the the shadow is being cast at different times japan's historic slim moon lander has powered down ahead of a likely mission ending cold lunar night time but not before grabbing some final images and loads of science data slim s-l-i-m short for smart lander for investigating moon nailed its precision touchdown on the rim of the shallow crater on jan 19 despite engine troubles that saw it land nose down. As a result, the spacecraft's solar cells face westward and are unable to receive the expected levels of sunlight, initially cutting operations on the lunar surface very short. But SLIM triumphantly reawakened re re nearly 10 days after landing as the sun finally shone on its panels. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, uh, which operates SLIM, has, sent, has spent recent days scanning the nearby lunar surface with its spacecraft's multiband camera to learn about its composition. MBC is designed to scope out um, olivion, olivi uh, olivion and other mi minerals through analysing the light signatures of the spectra of reflected sunlight according to the non-profit Planetary Society. JAXA Slim account on X, as in uh, that old uh, website, X, what was that? Twitter, yeah. Formally, oh, it even says it here, if I had to continue reading I wouldn't have struggled. <laughs> JAXA's Slim account on X, formerly Twitter, posted a final image taken by Slim's navigation camera on Jan 31, Japan time, uh, while stating that the agency confirmed the spacecraft had, had entered a dormant state as expected. Oh, excuse me. JAXA will need to wait out roughly 14.5 Earth day long lunar night time and then wait for a favourable lighting and temperature conditions later in the next lunar daytime, which starts around February 15, before SLIM can potentially be revived once more. The, for the probe to awake again, however, its electronics must hold up in face of the equatorial lunar night time, where temperatures of around minus 208 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 130 degrees Celsius can occur. But whether or not SLIM wakes up, the spacecraft has, has hit its full and extended mission goals by achieving a precision landing, deploying a pair of small rovers and demonstrating their inter- interoperability and containing or obtaining sorry a wealth of science data so there might be still life in slim we'll just have to wait till the 15th of february to see if it reactivates once the sun falls on those solar panels you're tuned to asv radio vk3 ekh now uh, there was a asteroid that burnt up over Germany on Jan 21. Um, scientists have re recovered pieces of an asteroid that burned up over Germany. 2024 BX1 is only the eighth object detected hours before it entered Earth's atmosphere. Pieces of the asteroid have been found, and uh, there's a post from the Natural History Museum in Berlin, uh, which includes the photo of the happy searchers with the fragment of the asteroid, and here's that picture of the happy people that found the the uh, 
Meteor. And um, from the original article, Germans out and about around 1.30 local time on the morning of 21 of Jan 2024 were in a perfect spot to see an unusual but not un unexpected phenomenon. A tiny asteroid about one metre in size, dubbed 2024 BX1, streaked across the sky in the west eastern Germany before dis dis disintegrating. <laughs> Here's what it looked like from a camera in Leipzig. I didn't, uh, I haven't got that. It, it, it wasn't much to see. It was just a, a very quick burn and it disappeared. So I didn't worry about recording that. But having said that, oh, excuse me. The asteroid was first detected by Christian Snarzecki, a researcher from the Konkoli Observatory in Budapest. NASA later confirmed the asteroid's path over Berlin in a post on social media. While the orbit was no th threat to the planet, uh, or while the oh, sorry, while the object was no threat to Earth, it was it, an opportunity to test asteroid spotting capabilities on Earth in case something more catastrophic is ever on the way. Objects this small can reach the Earth once a year. This normal. Um, that's normal, and the as telescopes and their capabilities get better, we're bound to discover more and more, uh, says NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So, yeah, um, it might have been in the 6 o'clock news, I don't know, but did hear about it somewhere, but there it is. And next is an article about X-ray image of the universe reveals X-ray image of universe reveals almost 1 million high energy objects and these are mind blowing numbers published 16 hours ago um, let me see there's, uh, where's that image there's an image associated with this yeah, that'll do hang on I'll get to it in a minute. Um, okay, the scientific breadth and impact of the survey is quite overwhelming. It's hard to put into words, the author says. The first data released to the public from the E. Rossiter Sky Survey comprises an X-ray view of half the sky over Earth encompassing almost a million high-energy cosmic sources, including over 700,000 supermassive black holes. This catalogue, dubbed the Rosetta All-Sky Survey Catalogue, -E -E, ERASS-1, -E was published on Thursday, 1st of February. It constitutes the largest ever catalogue of the universe's most powerful sources of energy, like exploding massive stars and black hole powered active galactic nuclei that shines brightly in x-rays and here's this image I'll bring it across i'm still streaming on youtube nice to see um yeah so uh where was i just now um so, yeah, so it constitutes the largest ever catalogue of the universe's most powerful sources of energy, like exploding massive stars and black hole-powered gal active galactic nuclei that shine brightly in X-rays. The release also details the largest known structures in the universe, uh, cosmic web filaments and of hot gas that connects galaxies and clusters. The results show that in just half a year of operations beginning after launch on July 13, 2019, Ear Rosetta has managed to discover more high-energy X-ray sources than has been found in six decades of examining the sky. Considered a major milestone in the 60 or so years of X-ray astronomy, ERAS-1 e -RAS uh, could help answer some of cosmology's biggest questions. 
like how did the universe evolve and why is the very fabric of space expanding at an accelerated rate? And this image, uh, it's on screen at the moment, <laughs> um, is two, it's two versions of E. Rosetta, all sky survey catalogue data right, and the X-ray sky over the Earth, which is also right, and X-ray sources. Accompanying the ERASA 1 data are almost 50 scientific papers published across a range of topics, adding to an existing 200 papers already written using data from E. Rosetta's telescope. The main aim of E. Rosetta is to use clusters of galaxies to observe how dark energy accelerates the expansion of the universe. These 250 or so papers, however, demonstrate the extent to which the instrument and its data have gone beyond its goal, or this goal. These papers, including the discovery of over 1,000 supercluster of galaxies, superclusters of galaxies, the revelation of two quasi-periodic erupting black holes, and the determination of the impact that stars X-ray radiation has on water and atmosphere retention of planets that orbit them. This, the, the scientific breadth uh, and impact of the survey is quite overwhelming. It's hard to put into a few words the spokesperson of the, the, of the German E. Rosetta Consortium, Maria uh, Salvato, said in a statement, but the papers published by the team will speak for themselves, she says. So, uh, yeah, so uh, e, e, e Rosetta uh, is, um, is doing quite a lot for X-ray imaging of the universe. And uh, that's courtesy of space.com. Okay, at uh, 11 minutes to 11, let's go into our final article for tonight. And uh, this is courtesy, courtesy of astronomy.com. The 10 Greatest James Webb Space Telescope Discoveries So Far. Cosmic breakthroughs continue to pour from NASA's giant infrared space telescope. The ground in French Guiana, Guiana literally shook as the rockets on the Ariane 5 launch vehicle ignited the morning of December 25, 2021. The raw signalled the start of the James Webb Space Telescope month-long journey to its current home some 1.5 million kilometres from Earth. Although it took scientists and engineers an additional five months to get the 6.5 metre telescope ready for action, the wait was worth it. In the two years since its launch, James Webb Space Telescope has tr transformed our view of the universe. And here is one person's take on the discovery of 10 top 10 discoveries to date, not wanting to play favourites. Um, the author says, I've organised a list of the distance from far away to our cosmic neighbourhood. And I might add that, that apparently uh, there is a James Webb documentary um, showing at uh, um, IMAX Cinema. Um, I didn't collect any data information on that tonight, but I, I have heard that there is a, a new uh, documentary um, bringing forth all the discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope to IMAX cinema. So check your IMAX theatre out and uh, see what times there are. So in a nutshell, <laughs> and uh, this could take up the next 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll, I won't... Um, go too, too much into detail, but the 10, uh, I'll, I'll just read out the titles of these 10 things. Um, big bright galaxies at cosmic dawn is one thing. Early supermassive black holes. 
Dust in the universe's youth, tightening cosmic tension, studying star formation in detail, a dusty supernova remnant, a jumbo surprise, a molecular exoplanet revolution, rings around rings around the ring nebula, diving into protoplanetary disks. And that's the 10 main things that make up this article. <laughs> um, so, yes, so big bright galaxies at cosmic dawn. Before JWST, astronomers thought galaxies began as small clouds of gas, dust and stars that gradually grew into the island's universe as we see today. But the telescope's ability to see infrared radiation allows it to peer farther into space and thus further back in time to when galaxies first formed. James Webb Space Telescope has found several of these youngsters that date to within 500 million years of the Big Bang, and they are much brighter than anyone expected. Then there's early supermassive black holes. Everyone knows that black holes grow as they devour passing stars and clouds of gas and dust. So it become it so it, it comes as as a surprise to find a supermassive black hole lurking in the early universe when they haven't had much time to chow into their surroundings. James Webb Space Telescope has discovered several black holes weighing about 1 billion solar masses dating to 800 million years back after the Big Bang. Perhaps even more importantly, the telescope has turned up much more, much smaller um, black holes with masses from 1 million to, 10 mil to tens of millions of suns at even earlier times. And this could provide astronomers with enough data to figure out how these behemoths evolve. And then there's dust in the universe's youth. Dust appears all around us in fluffy bunnies looking around our beds in the dark clouds blocking our view of the Milky Way and as signatures in the spectra of distant galaxies. Most dust contains carbon, so it's a relative latecomer to the cosmic um, cosmos because the early stars had to forge the element from their initial supplies of hydrogen and helium. Yet James Webb Space Telescope has found dust in a galaxy just 1 billion years after the Big Bang. The dust has a unique chemical fingerprint, suggesting it may be a mix of graphite or diamond-like grains created in the earlier stars. It opens a new window into dust production and galaxy formation. And then there's tightening the cosmic tension. A number of a few numbers in astronomy are more important than the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe. The European Space Agency's Planck spacecraft combined observations of the cosmic background radiation with the standard model of cosmology to nail its value at 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Observations of Cepheid variable stars and Type 1a supernova made with the Hubble Space Telescope and other instruments show a high value, about 73 kilometers a second uh, per megaparsec, creating the so-called Hubble tension. James Webb Space Telescope has confirmed this higher value to be much, much better precision. And the discrepancy between the two methods suggests that the scientists are missing something in how the universe works or have made multiple errors in their measurements that all act in the same direction. And then there's studying star formation in detail. Stars form in dense clouds of gas and dust. Unfortunately, dust blocks visible light, shielding much of the process from our view. But the infrared radiation James Webb Space Telescope sees penetrates dust, opening up new window into star birth. Both example, for, for example, it has revealed thousands of new stars buried deep within the Eagle Nebula M16 that Hubble could not reach. And James Webb Space Telescope has showed remarkable detail in a section of near, nearby um, row, oh, I can't even pronounce that one, but a, yeah, 
particular complex. The telescope's images have revealed dozens of young low-mass stars as well as the jets they emit, which light up surrounding clouds and molecular hydrogen. Okay. So there's a few a few others there. Uh, a, me a molecular exoplanet revolution. Although images draw the most attention, spectroscopy plays a huge role in the James Webb Space Telescope's explorations. It allows astronomers to determine the redshift and, the, and thus distance of faraway galaxies and to analyse the chemical composition of astronomical objects. However, is, is this more important, sorry, no, nowhere is this more important than in the study of exoplanet atmospheres, where James Webb Space Telescope's infrared capabilities allow it to detect mo molecules invisible in optical light. Among its many discoveries, JWST has found methane, carbon dioxide, and dim dimethyl sulfide in, uh, in the rocky world K218b. Uh, in a star habitable zone, hinting that it could harbour a water ocean on its surface. So yes, there is no doubt that the James Webb Space Telescope has uh, has definitely discovered quite a lot of things, and it is in, it's still in its infancy, infancy, and uh, clearly uh, lots to still discover. And like I say, if you have got time to visit the uh, IMAX Cinema worth checking out uh, the documentary spaceweather.com the solar wind is currently at 345.3 kilometers a second at a density of 1.45 protons per cubic centimeter the current disk of the sun which i have a picture here of uh, so there it is, the current uh, disk of the sun with several sunspots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight sunspots there. The current sunspot number is 113. The radio sun, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres, is currently 137 solar flux units. And the KP index... The planetary K index, Kp, is currently equal to 1.33, which is considered quiet. The 24-hour max Kp figure is equal to 1.67 and also considered quiet. There is a coronial hole uh, on the surface of the Sun which is facing in our general direction at this point. So a minor stream of solar wind is flowing from this southern coronial hole. Uh, a coronial mass ejection might graze Earth this weekend. Uh, yesterday, the February 1st, a filament of magnetism in the Sun's northern hemisphere erupted, hurtling a CME into space. Most of the CME will sail north of our planet, but not all. Um, a NASA model predicts a glancing blow on Sunday the 4th, the impact could spark a minor G-class uh, geomagnetic storm with auroras and high alti at high altitude. Um, okay, and there is an article here on Will Megacon's Talations Damage Earth's Magnetic Field? What is this all about? Something unprecedented is happening in Earth orbit. In only a few short years, the satellite population has skyrocketed, more than doubling since 2020. In the past year alone, more satellites have been launched than during the, la the first 30 years of the space age. Much of this activity is driven by SpaceX and its growing mega constellation of Starlink internet satellites. And there's, there's kind of a little illustration here of all that. Um, that's all it really is, it's just an illustration. <laughs> Environmentalists have raised many concerns about Starlink, including light pollution of the night sky. 
a potentially hazardous traffic jam in low Earth orbit and even ozone depletion. Copycat mega constellations by other companies and, and countries will only multiply these concerns. Now, there's a new reason to worry. According to a new study by Sierra Slotter, mega constellations could alter the weaken and weaken Earth's magnetic field. Salter is a graduate student at the University of Iceland, working on her PhD in plasma physics. She recently realised something overlooked by many senior colleagues. More than 500,000 satellites are expected to decades uh, are expected in decades ahead, primarily to build internet mega constellations. Every satellite that goes up will eventually come down disintegrating in Earth's atmosphere. This will create a massive layer of conducting electrically charged particles around our planet. To understand the scale of the problem, consider the following. If you gather up every charged particle in Earth's Van Allen radiation belts, and there's a little graphic here of this, <coughs> just showing on the screen right now, so, to understand the scale of the problem, consider the following. If you gathered up every charged particle in Earth's Van Allen radiation belts, their combined mass would be only 0 0.00018 kilogram. Other components of the magnetosphere, such as the ring current and plasma plasmasphere, are even less massive. For comparison... The mass of a second-generation Starlink satellite is 1.250 kilograms, that, that is to say 1,250 kilograms, all of which will become con conductive, um, was it? Yeah, conductive debris when the satellite is eventually deorbited. Metal debris from a single deorbited Starlink satellite is 7 million times more massive than the Van Allen belts. An entire mega construction, <laughs> an, an, an entire mega constellation is billions of times more massive. These ratios point to a big problem. The space industry is adding enormous amounts of material to the magnetosphere in comparison to natural levels of particulate matter. Due to the conductive nature of satellite debris, this may perturb or change things. There is already evidence of this process in action. A 2023 study by researchers using high-altitude NASA aircraft found that 10% of aerosols in the stratosphere containing aluminium and other metals from disintegrating satellites and rocket ships stages. These particles are drifting down from the ablation zone 70 to 80 kilometers above Earth's surface where meteors and satellites burn up. Salter decided to look for the changes in electrical properties of the ablation zone and she found something. A NASA model of the upper atmosphere shows a sharp increase in the d by length, d d e b y e d by length, just where satellites break apart when they are being deorbited. The d by length, d e b y e d by length, I guess that's how you pronounce it, is a number that tells researchers how far an unbalanced electrical charge can be felt in, in conducting plasmas. The fact that it changes abruptly in the same place satellites disintegrate may be significant. Explorating into the future, Salter worries that satellite debris could weaken Earth's magnetic field, the same magnetic field that protects us from cosmic rays and solar storms. So anyway, I'll, there's a, bit, there's a bit, bit more to that, but that's currently on spaceweather.com. So once again, you know, the <laughs> man's uh, domination of the planet and into space has, um, you know, other after uh, effects. So um, we definitely stuff up the environment one way or another, don't we? 
And there is a small amount of auroral activity over Antarctica, uh, which is this image here. So, uh, but nothing to write home about. So there is a smaller glow over Antarctica as we speak. All right, uh, that's about it from Space Weather. Um, as of February the 2nd, 2024, there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids, but none of them are on a collision course with Earth at this present point in time. Thank goodness for that. Um, all right, I think that's about it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a screen in front of me that shows me my emails that have come through and or comments on Discord. So all I will say is thank you for those people that have, have come up on Discord tonight in the chat room. I shall check it out as soon as I'm finished here. I shall check it out and make uh, uh, the odd comment um, when I'm finished here. And to the folks that uh, sent me emails, probably two or three, I'll uh, do a quick reply on email. I, I, I still have to uh, try and get the system set up here so that I can uh, uh, monitor these, uh, these um, uh, emails. Um, I think that's about it. I'm sure there was something else I had here too. Oh yeah, Astrophys. Just a, a quick plug for astrophys.com. And I do have a, uh, a slide up for that as well. Uh, there it is. <coughs> um, yeah, um, astrophys.com. Uh, Brendan O'Brien um, hosts an exceptional astronomy podcast. Um, with two big episodes each month about astrophysics, astrophotography, space and science, big data, astro AI and particle physics. On the first of each month is Dr. Ian Musgrave gives us his monthly star, star guide uh, plus a unique astrophotography challenge. Oh yes, the astrophotography challenge. Yes, yes. So anyway, uh, astrophys.com, A-S-T-R-O-P-H-I-Z.com. Visit it out. There's, there's now 184, I guess, uh, 885 episodes there that um, to listen to. Thank you, Brendan. Happy birthday to you too, by the way. I'll leave that till next week, I think. Okay. Um, you have been listening to uh, another broadcast on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, ASV Radio, coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ in Nary Warren South at the new studio downstairs, still coming together. So on that, uh, I shall take a quick listen on 80 metres to see if there's any stations wishing to, to call in, if I can find my pen... <laughs> I did. I, oh, the pencil that'll have to do. There is a pencil here. I thought I had a pen. All right. Um, this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to check in. VK3 Bravo, Sierra Foxtrot. This is VK3 KIS. Oh, feedbacks. <laughs> All right, I've got VK3 GL, VK3 JR, VK3 VIN, VK7 JAH, VK3 BSF, VK3 KIS. Did I leave anyone else th uh, off the list? Okay, take it away, Graham. VK3 GL, VK3 EKH. Yes, good evening, VK3 EKH, VK3 GL. Um, friendly, a very good evening to yourself and everyone else who's uh, checked in tonight as well. I think I pretty much heard every check in that came up. Good signal from you tonight. Um, good, uh, a good 20 overnight. A little bit of distortion, as you indicated earlier on, and of course, we will be. Uh, uh, the YouTube feed um, temporarily as well. 
Yeah, no worries, Graham. VK three GL, good signal coming in. Uh, good uh, twenty over nine, so uh, not a problem at all. But understand you're working, and uh, not a problem. It's up to you if you want to catch the YouTube. It's not all that exciting. Um, <laughs> anyway, all right, not a problem. Thanks, mate, and uh, thank you for very much for calling in. Uh, VK th VK three JR, I think is next. Uh, take it away, Frank. VK three JR, VK three EKH. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe I got the call sign wrong. Uh, Frank, you there? VK three JR. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was distracted. Uh, VK three uh, EKH. VK three JR. Yes. Yeah, uh, good evening to you and to everyone. Special good evening to you, Ian. Good to hear you on and coming through so well. Uh, very good uh, broadcast as usual. Well. Thanks, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Thank you for uh, uh, the report on the missions. I'll um, uh, have a, a listens. I'll do listens. <laughs> um, no worries, Frank. Good signal from you. You're 10 over 9 and they're coming through loud and clear. So not a problem at all. Uh, thanks, mate. Uh, Ian, VK3VIN. I heard you on 40 metres the other day too. Um, last weekend, I think it was. Um I think there was a, a, one of those uh, nets that uh, you just call in to announce that you're listening and keep in the, and that's it, keeps on going. Anyway, I heard you. So a short skip on 40 metres was good. Anyway, VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Okay, good, Clint, and uh, good evening, everybody. Hi, Frank. Yeah, it's Ian. Yeah. 
some uh, positive change, I think. But who knows? <laughs> Amateur radio, the radio frequencies, etc. Good broadcast. Uh, I did enjoy the information about the phases of the moon. Yeah, thanks, Ian. VK3, VIN, VK3, EKH. Uh, uh, during your over, I had the opportunity of uh, getting into my email uh, on the uh, the computer that I'm using here. So I can see your email. Uh, not a problem at all. Thank you very much, Lee. And uh, all very good. Yes, you're. Uh, it's. In, I'm not running the linear tonight. Uh, the the. Uh, um, I'm just running the the uh, the Pro Three at. Uh, it's slightly reduced power level too. I don't think it's the full hundred watts either, because I've got problems with RF getting into my uh, my modem, and uh, the level that I'm set, I've got it set at right now is uh, is must be okay because the modem hasn't dropped out. My YouTube stream has continued to go, uh, so <laughs> which is good for those uh, watching, and uh, not a problem at all. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, it, the, <laughs> uh, the amount of hardware that's, uh, uh, orbiting, uh, above us is, uh, is, is pretty shocking. And, uh, I, I think of the, the movie Gravity, where, uh, uh, where, uh, a couple of satellites uh, collide and create this debris field. And of course, it just scatters and takes out just about everything else. Um, I mean, that's uh, the, the a likelihood um, of uh, these these uh, satellites, some satellites colliding, and the debris field that gets generated. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's just it's just straight out of a science fiction film. Anyway, all right, no worries, Ian. Thanks very much for calling in. Really appreciate that, and uh, the report too. Not a problem. Uh, okay, now, uh, Martin, VK7JAH, down in Launceston, VK3EKH, have to say Martin. Uh, VK3EKH, VK7JAH, good evening, please. Hi, uh, good evening, Martin, and thank you for your call. Uh, yes, I am uh, listening to you, 
Yeah, thanks, Martin. Not a problem, VK7, JH, VK3, EKH returning. Not a problem. <coughs> yes, good signal coming in from you. You're hovering around uh, 5 to 10 over 9, so uh, quite readable and uh, not a problem at all. Um, yeah, and um, okay on the, the, uh, the YouTube stream. Yeah, well, it's holding in there at the moment, and... Uh, uh, certainly, this is not the, the, the my favourite uh, uh, camera angle, so, so um, I I just don't have much room behind the monitor here at the moment. I've got to do some fiddling. Uh, you can see the the, the computer dominating the end of the bench here, and uh, uh, yeah, there's normally I'd, I'd stick a mon a computer um, a camera just behind the monitor. So uh, we'll uh, we'll work it out uh, as we go. Um, but uh, right behind me is uh, is just a, a, a mess of things. Uh, there's a, a couple of racks, and uh, well, there's a, there's a rack just here containing a lot of stuff, and uh, uh, an empty rack behind me, which is about to get full of stuff. So, um, and of course, I, I want to that wall that you're seeing uh, in the behind me here on my left. That's there's the, I want to put a bench that runs the full length of the wall. Uh, it's about um, about three meters, three or four meters, and that'll uh, uh, contain some uh, some of the other uh, station equipment, which will be nice to be finally set out on a, on a bench. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. So overall, the 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 the, the overall shape will uh, eventually come into view, but um, uh, otherwise, I'm I'm keeping the mess out of out of the shot here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, Martin. And uh, hopefully, in the very near future, uh, we'll be able to uh, have a, a camera uh, operating down at the uh, Scope Dome, and uh, so I can um, give you shots of uh, inside the dome as well. Which I'm looking forward to that. But we still haven't got the the dome assembled yet. It's it's there's it's, that's still in abeyance. We still have issues with the uh, uh, with the deck. So that's another story. Thanks, Martin. Uh, cross to Peter, I think it is. VK3 BSF, VK3 EKH. Of course. Yeah, Okay, Clint, uh, 
73. Uh, this is the first time this year I caught you. I missed you. If you've had any broadcast prior to this this year, but uh, happy new year, late one. And uh, catch you again next week, VK3 EKH, VK3 BSF. Yeah, thanks, Peter. VK3 BSF, VK3 EKH. Now, this is the uh, the second broadcast um, for the year. Um, I was planning on coming back uh, on the 19th of January, I think it was. Uh, but I, I, I had... Uh, the, the shack was completely dismantled. Um, this this whole bench wasn't even here. This, this desktop uh, was still... Upstairs, there's a, a great big hole in the in the ceiling. In fact, I'll, I'll quickly turn the camera around and I'll show you this hole in the ceiling. Um, I'll turn the camera forward, and uh, there it is. So, <laughs> so that that's the uh, the um, uh, it, because I live in a barn. You know, like most barns have a a. a uh, a, a hole in the roof or the floor depending on where you are and uh, so up there was where the shack was and uh, I've, I've brought everything down um, to um, to uh, to down here so there's the uh, that's one of the racks that I brought down that's the television transmitter there and of course the uh, the Bench. This was a particularly difficult bench to uh, to bring down. I had to drop that on a, on a rope. And uh, just behind me is the the rest of the shack. Uh, there's the uh, the telefunken, and uh, I, I'm all that's going to be cleared out. All that stuff in the corner there, and uh, bookcase. It's all all going to go, and there'll be one single bench that'll run right down that full length of the wall, which will have all the Collins station and the ASU station. So uh, everything will be sorted out in due course. Otherwise, uh, the rest is, um, I can't swing it around, here we are. That's, that's looking at the lounge room. That's uh, all my mother's paintings there on the wall. And uh, the TV, that's where I usually sit. And uh, all the other junk, you can't really see it there, but there's a whole lot of junk in the, in the background as well. So this is downstairs. There's the spiral staircase, that's what I go. <laughs> I travel up and down every day, <clears throat> and uh, now I've got, like I said, I've got the shack downstairs, so um, it's still coming together, and uh, I'll uh, I'll stick another camera uh, in a different, I'll, I'll try and have two cameras so I can change between. So there it is, for those watching YouTube, you have to catch up with that in, in uh, 20 seconds time, <laughs> major delay. Uh, but for those watching on the television repeater, it's uh, much, much, fa much faster. Uh, all right. Was there anybody else there? Oh, Andrew, <laughs> VK3KIS. Sorry for leaving you on the last there, Andrew. VK3KIS, VK3EKH. Thanks, Andrew. VK3 KIS, VK3 EKH. Yeah, unfortunately, there's uh, there's no no astronomy happening from this location yet. Um, uh, I I had four weeks off uh, over Christmas, and I was really really hoping that the um, that the dome would have been assembled, and uh, I would have had a telescope uh, up and running, and um, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to. Have, uh, do any photography yet because I, I don't really have a camera 
uh, for doing astrophotography at this stage, except for my mobile phone. Um, but certainly being able to use the uh, the uh, telescope um, directly is the intention at this stage um, to to do everything manually and get get really familiar with uh, the telescope and how to use the dome and all that sort of thing. And uh, but uh, as soon as I can afford uh, a camera, um, I'm I'm pretty keen to get two cameras. Not straight away, mind you, because they are expensive items, but. Um, I'd like to get a, uh, a planetary camera and a deep sky camera um, and uh, and uh, uh, um, and of course I wouldn't mind getting a camera dedicated for monochrome uh, monochrome work um, yeah so uh, all those are coming in due time due course the stars and the universe and the sky will always be there <laughs> so I'm not uh, I'm not particularly missing out on anything um, although if a if a comet comes into view that they they don't last for very long they they they, they come and go very quickly so I'm, I'm pretty keen to, uh, to to catch up with a comet in our skies next time there is one it's a pity that Haley, Comet Haley, is uh, is is uh, it's still so many years away from making a, a reappearance. Two thousand and sixty-one, I think it was. I read out t tonight. I'm not sure if I'm going to be around in two thousand and sixty-one. Anyway, never mind. All right. Um, thanks, Andrew. And um, is, was there any other stations wishing to check in? VK three EKH listening. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, this is the, like I said, this is the second broadcast for the year. I think it's the second. <laughs> um, hopefully, I'll uh, I'll have things uh, a little bit better sorted out for next uh, next Friday, so that I'm, I don't stuff around with the audio problem. I I inadvertently pressed uh, uh, one of the buttons on the mixer here, which just killed the audio altogether, like that. I oh, don't know. No, so that's working. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't know why it didn't work before, but now it is, of course. It's always audio problems. Always, we always have audio issues. Um, Wayne, thank you for sending your email. Um, I did uh, read that, so uh, very pleasant to you. Good evening to you, there, dear sir. And uh, um, uh, note that the audio uh, is uh, was sounding a little bit off at the beginning. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still sounding a bit off, but uh, I did increase a little bit of, of a, a few highs in it, so um, it shouldn't sound too bad. Um, but there is, uh, I can hear RF getting into things here. Uh, I've got problems with RF getting things. Uh, maybe I should be earthing some stuff. Nothing. There's no earthing here at, except mains earth, so maybe that's my problem. Um, all right, this is VK3, Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding tonight's broadcast uh, for the 2nd of February. Thank you for listening in and viewing on the TV repeater and uh, also on the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll be back next Friday on 3541 to, to do it all again. Um, I think that's about it. Right. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel um, with VK3 CSJ on the microphone, uh, concluding transmissions tonight. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Okay. Um, um, um. All right. Uh, yes, Graham. I was just about to finish up on YouTube and TV.
And what's significant about your big birthday? Is it turning 50 or something? Oh, 60, sorry. 50, I said 50. Oh, boy. Yeah, okay, 60. All right. <laughs> oh, dear. VK3GL, VK3CSJ. Oh, RF getting into a speaker here. I, I, you can see the, the 9000D speaker in there. I, I can hear my signal coming through on that speaker. RF getting into everything. Uh, I've got a... I've got a, a, an earth stake uh, out the window here and um, I really need to drill a hole in the wall and bring that earth wire in and uh, see if, if uh, earthing some of the stuff around here will stop this problem. Um, but uh, when I was upstairs, uh, I, you know, I still, I still had RF getting into the modem, but it didn't seem to be as bad. I, I could actually run uh, the the hundred watts from the radio. It wasn't a problem. But down here, uh, it's yeah. I'm gonna. I can see where problems are existing here. There's cables running everywhere behind the bench. It's all a bit messy at the moment, and um, you know a lot of the cables that I had you make up for me are now um, too long. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, have to, uh, um, at some stage, uh, re-terminate some of these cables to uh, more appropriate lengths for the way I'm going to have the, the system here. Anyway, um, okay, on the ham fest, I didn't know there was one coming up, but that doesn't matter. I'm not really um, going out to ham fests these days, so uh, I don't think I'll be heading. It's a... Oh, sorry. I've been pretty tired. Um, I, I spent a, a, quite a few hours today cutting grass. I really, I really should have been in here um, sorting out all the the, uh, the issues here um, rather than leaving it to the last hour. Uh, but that's nothing unusual for me. But I really did want to get most of the grass cut. I haven't finished. There's still the, the um, all the portion along the creek. That needs to be done, and the over in the far paddock where the the deck and the dome is, that that all needs to be nipped. So uh, I want to try and get the the rest of the grass cut before the temperature gets too hot this weekend. Um, yeah, so it's always a challenge to cutting the grass around here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I want to try and. Uh, continue working here in the shack there's a there's a few things i've got a, a rack over here that I, i've got to put stuff in uh i've got to clear upstairs up upstairs is still messy so i want to try and um bring a lot of the stuff up there down here um i'll, I'll leave the asu station upstairs for a while because i don't have any bench for that uh, that includes the collin station um they have to stay where they are until i get the bench a new bench made up um yeah anyway but um the only, the only thing about um being down here is um oh here comes kiska my my long-haired cat <laughs> just 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 jumped off the spiral staircase straight to the floor it's okay kiss it's okay here's my big pussy cat six kilograms of cat oh she's so heavy kiss kiss look at this long hair cat and uh, she's not happy about the two blacks um so they haven't she hasn't quite made friends with um uh, with the, the two new kittens but um anyway there it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's a beautiful puss, this one. Go on. Yeah. All right, so um, there it is. And... <laughs> uh, kiss, 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 kiss. <laughs> yeah. And, yes, kiss. What? You want something to eat, I guess. Some late night snack. <clears throat> well, I'm thinking about putting on a movie. Actually, I might watch um, the the final episode of Twilight. 
I just caught up with that this week. I don't know why I got caught up with it. I know Christian Christian Stewart's in it. I really fancy her. Got a thing for Christian Stewart. So uh, she stars in uh, Twilight. It's a vampire series. I'm not usually watching vampire movies, but I just I don't know, caught interest in it. So uh, I might catch up with the last of that um, part two. <laughs> Sorry about that. A lot of nonsense. Um, in the meantime, there's not much more to report. Yes, we're back at work. Um, it's a bit of a struggle to keep busy. Um, but we're still there. And uh, there's... Uh, oh, I'm, yep. Let's work. So... <coughs> oh, I'm, I'm looking at another car. Um, uh, I shouldn't be. But and I don't. I haven't made any firm decisions. But uh, it's a it's a it's a red, a red Holden. It's it's a um, a YS. I think it's the number. A Commodore YS model series two or three. Anyway, um, uh, the, the the same fellow that uh, I bought the Subaru off has this uh, Commodore, which is uh, a two thousand. 2004 model I think and it's only got 150 odd thousand kilometers on the clock anyway thinking about it because I miss my red Holden so <laughs> that's, that's another story VK3 GL VK3 CSJ Well, I do. Oh, Christian Stewart. Oh, well, yeah, I change. Occasionally, one actor falls out of favour. Yeah, you know, my usual time. 
you were living in Daniel on West, I popped around one night, I took you for a belt down the, um, down the road. Um, and then um, I think I had the adventure after that, and that was a VYVZ adventure. And then they went to the, the wider body cars where I had the, v, the VE and uh, VE Series 1, VE Series 2. VK3GL, VK3CSJ, very good. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I knew you were planning a, a trip overseas. Uh, something was coming up, but I must have forgotten about the fact that it was going to, to uh, it was going to be a Japan trip. So um, yeah, very good. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I, I haven't heard back uh, from. Uh, um, is it Simon uh, about the display on the for the nine thousand? Yet he's uh, 
he's he's uh, he's apparently sent a uh, oh sorry oh god he's apparently sent an email off to Yesu Japan um, you know with a query about the uh, the display um, for the nine thousand but he hasn't you know he hasn't sent any further emails to me to say I'm waiting for a reply or uh, I've had a reply back or anything but if um if I, if Yesu in Japan wherever that may be um actually has a uh, some of these displays uh, <laughs> while you're over there uh great <laughs> Have a have a quick visit to Yesu Corporation and and see if you can pick up a couple of displays, huh? Might be a good uh, good timing for that. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But um, I really do hope that uh, the display will be uh, is available. I even if it's a blue one, my my display is a is an amber one. But um, uh, if if they only have, like, for instance, I only have blue. Uh, fluorescent display then I'll, I'll be I don't care I'll, I'll be quite happy to change it to to blue <laughs> um, just just that's so long I can get a, a really good bright display happening um, that'll be really good for this 9000 um, that's another story too okay on the cat and the dog yeah look I've got uh, um, the the two little black kittens uh, are pretty well key box trained um when, when i when i first got these two kittens here uh, the, the first thing to do was to put down a tray of of uh of dry litter and you know they went straight to it uh, without any you know no training at all like they just went straight to it so um the the trick is to keep <coughs> to keep the tray clean uh if it gets too soiled um they protest and they, they by bro, by protesting they they will often piddle uh, in a, in on something somewhere else, and they did that a couple of times, much to my disgruntlement. Uh, I I generally what I do is if uh, if if um, if the cats have piddled in the corner where they shouldn't, I um, I, I, grab, I grab them by the scruff of the neck and uh, rub their nose in their own piddle. And uh, and and say no, don't do that. Really, you know, in a an authoritative tone, and then chuck them through the door. So um, yeah, that's generally one technique, and they may learn, may may not. But the the thing is, to, for in my case at least, I, I've just got to try and keep the kitty litter boxes clean. So that's uh, that's the main thing. <sighs> Oh God! I can feel my speech centres closing down, Gray. So uh, I'm going to make a cup of coffee, and I might um, uh, I might make a toasted cheese sandwich because I just feel like that. So uh, I'll I'll let you go now. It's coming up to midnight. Let your clock off, <laughs> um, and uh, have a safe trip up to uh, wherever it is, Ballarat. On the ham fest, um, and okay on the car too. Um, I thought it was a YS, a VS. No, not a VS. That, that was my last car. YS. Maybe it was a YF. A VF. I can't remember now. I can't remember. But it's red. I've seen it, um, and it's in immaculate condition. It's uh, it's um, it's apparently been. It's a few things that have been done to it. The, it's got new. New shockers uh, on a special sports edition shockers or whatever you call it. It's black interior, um, and uh, there's a few things that have been done to this car. And uh, he's uh, he reckons that uh, he's quite happy to sell it to me for twenty grand. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I've got it. Like I say, and and pay it off. I don't, you know, I put a deposit. But you know he's happy for me just to to pay him every month something. So that's that's what tickles my fancy because it makes things a little bit easy for me. And then come August this year, I can then pay it right out when I get access to my super. 
So I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, because I, I do miss my Commodore, my, the power underfoot, um, and uh, the hi-fi system mainly. It's I really do miss having a good sound system in the car. The, the Subaru just doesn't cut it, just does not cut it. And uh, I, I haven't bothered in trying to make it work well. So um, I do miss a decent sound system in the car. And uh, although I'm not really sure what's in this this particular car, um, I've I've asked uh, Michael to see if he can drive it for a couple of days next week. So I bring brings it to work, and uh, I can check it out, uh, have a closer look, and uh, find out a few things. But uh, the 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 chain, yes, definitely. I, I will be asking about that. I, it's when I got this Subaru, and I discovered that the timing belt on the Subaru was pretty critical, because if the timing belt breaks on the Subaru, that's it. The, the engine stuffed apparently. So uh, I, I've made sure that a new belt was put on in the early days of having the Subaru. But I just look forward to being able to get into a car without struggling you know because each time i get into the subaru my my legs get squashed between the steering wheel and the chair the, the the seat um i know i can adjust things but i've adjusted the steering wheel so it's in the right position and the chair is up at maximum height so i can look over the front of the car that's that's i, I prefer when i'm sitting in the car i prefer that i i my eye line is going over the front of the car when i'm sitting at the car uh, I don't. I, I can't understand how people sit behind the steering wheel. They, they sit so low in a car that they're behind the steering wheel. That's just that's just shocking. I, I, I've always adjusted my seating and and, arra and sitting arrangement in a car uh, so that I can actually see at the front of the vehicle, and I and I, I create this eye line to the road. Um, Parents got electric electric seats this car too not not heating but uh, electric motor driven seats uh, that that'd be a bit of a novelty all right that's it we're over and out vk3 gl it's gone midnight it's the 3rd of february vk3 csj
Oh, VK3CAL and the group VK3CSJ. G'day, Kelvin. And uh, I'm I'm not sure if we've, we've spoken so uh, yet so far this year, but uh, all the best for 2024. Uh, hope it works out for you. Uh, no no serious issues, and uh, yeah, all the best. And a good signal coming down. You're five of nine plus. So uh, band noise is a bit quiet tonight. I think that's what's really helping uh, things a bit. But uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah, you might be right. Um, look, let let me get some details on this car. I I, I don't know what model it is exactly. I, it's a Commodore, um, <laughs> so I don't know whether it's a. I think it's a Series Three. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Um, he's mentioned it to me. He's, he rattles it off pretty quick, and uh, I'm not. You know, I'm not a. I'm not into cars in a big way, so. All these fancy details and names about uh, these cars, you know, uh, it, it just goes over me. Um, so um, if he if he brings the car in to work next week, uh, I'll take a you know I'll take a couple of pictures of it, and uh, I'll get all the details, you know what it is exactly. Um, and um, but he, he he reckons that uh, on the market at the moment, this car is 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 bringing twenty five around twenty five grand. Um, depending depending on its condition and its miles, uh, but because it's it's only done 150, I think it's 155 actually. Uh, because it's done 155k, something like that. Uh, it's you know it hasn't done huge mileage. Uh, is 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 the the key thing here. Um, so uh, but it's 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 been there's a there's there's a few things that have been done to it to to bring it up to a a, um, a standard some sort of standard and uh i i haven't seen inside so i don't know he reckons it's a black interior um so i i don't know how the car looks inside at all um anyway look i'll, I'll find out information and i'll let you know but uh he, he seems to think that 20 20k would be uh uh, pretty good for, for for me, you know. If he if he was to sell it to somebody else, it, it'd be <clears throat> he'd be looking at um, top top dollar, I guess. Anyway, we shall <clears throat> we shall investigate, and it's not not confirmed or anything. It's just like uh, you know, every now and then I, I say to Michael, you 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 want to sell that red red Holden of yours, and he's, he says to me, everything's for sale, Clint. <laughs> It's just, it just uh, depends on the thing, the details, I suppose. All right, um, I'll uh, I'll leave you with that, and uh, I'll I'll try and find some more information on that for you. Oh. Um, I think that's it. VK three GL, VK three CSJ in the group. I knew. That's why I'm asking. Well mentioned it.
Yeah, thanks, Gray. Yeah, well, that's, that's why I, I've mentioned it to you because uh, I know you're a, you're a Commodore connoisseur, <laughs> connoisseur. Um, and you know, look, I've I've had two Commodores in my life. Um, you know, I, I I enjoyed the VL, and I had the VL for 16 years, and then the VS Holden. That was a nice upgrade, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, I, 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 yes, the VS was nice, especially when I first got it. <laughs> beautiful, had a beautiful red uh, color, a deep red to it. Of course, the VS had the the bonnet problem. The 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 Duco uh, on the bonnet was peeling. I think it was anyway. So um, yeah, there's just a few things uh, with the VS that was due to uh, to pass on really. Then I went to this Subaru. <laughs> Oh, the super has been all right. It's it, the, the temperature issue gave me um, grief there for a while, but since we drilled an extra hole in the thermostat, it's uh, it's been behaving beautifully. <laughs> it just doesn't have the power though; just can't take off quickly in it. Anyway, but I'll I'll find out what this thing is and let you know for sure. Cheers, Gray. Cheers, Kelvin. Have a nice weekend, guys, and stay cool on Sunday. Uh, um, 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 I'll put it across to you there, Calvin. VK three C A L VK three C S J. Hey, Greg. Hey, Gray. Yeah, that's. I I tell you that this this last ten years have gone past just too quickly and it is scary. Yeah, it sounds lovely. I can just imagine it. Um, I, I love that new car smell, sound, smell, sound, sound, smell. <sighs> see you, Graham. See you, Colin. You'd know about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I I think with the S Superu when I picked up the Superu we had a um, a fellow come out from the RACV that did the uh, the checks and balances uh, to make sure that it was roadworthy and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll probably do the same thing for uh, for this uh, Commodore if I if I go down the road, uh, most definitely, in fact. See you, Kelvin. See you, Gray. Good night, everybody who's still watching YouTube and the repeater. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll be back next week to do it all again. Hope it was a completely riveting television. Uh, <laughs> stand by for color bars. See everyone watch, still watching. Bye for now. Bye.